Perfect. All right, uh, we're here. We're rolling uh, with uh, Mike Bolsito. Said that right? Yeah, Look you at did. That. Yeah, it was a pretty simple. We're off to a good start. Off to a great start. And uh, in my series of only interviewing a gentleman named Mike or Michael, uh, here we go. So you've done a lot of things. Uh, you are co-founder of Product Collective. Yeah. Or possibly founder. Yeah. Co-founder. Co co-founder. Yeah. yeah. Um, you wrote a book uh, pertaining to seed funding uh, for the rest of us. Yes. What was the actual title Startup of it? Startup Seed Funding for the yeah. Rest of Us. Yeah, that's yeah. right. So I have the book. Uh, I haven't finished the book, so I, I want to throw that out there. But it's uh, it's right up there with uh, venture funding, so in, cool. in my opinion. Well, I appreciate people, that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you uh, you do interviews for what station? Yeah, I co-host Rocket Ship yeah. FM, so, yeah. um, which pretty much a podcast for entrepreneurs and product people is kind of how we think of yeah. it. Yeah, so I mean, you're you're super involved. Uh, before I keep on just prattling off things I know about you, <laughs> give me a, a good, concise, deep dive into who you are, how you got to be where you're at now, what you've been a part of, and, and kind of really what you're working on now. Yeah. Um, well, to rewind, I mean, I've been involved with early stage technology startups pretty much my whole career. So I graduated from Case Western Reserve, um, the business school there, so Weatherhood School of Management, sure. back in 2005. Mm -hmm. And really ever since then, it's been tech startups, whether I was a early employee, so I was uh, employee number one at a company called Findaway, mm -hmm. um, or some the, the person who is the employee number two, in my opinion, would like to say he's employee number one. So we like to go back and forth there. Employee 1.5 it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I co-founded a company of my own, um, mm -hmm. eFuneral, um, mm -hmm. back in the day. And it was acquired in 2014, but I always call it a fail sale. Sure. In that, you know, I, I was not living on a beach after that acquisition. Right. I was trying to find another job, right? Okay. Um, but that actually, the company that acquired it still is operating it today. So it's mm -hmm. kind of cool that something we built still is out there living, exists, even though yeah. you know we, we didn't accomplish what we wanted to with it. Sure. Um, and then after that, I started getting into a couple product roles, which was something that I didn't really know was a thing at the time. I remember I was recruited as director of product strategy for a company here in town in Cleveland. And the first thing I did was Google, what does a director of product strategy do? Like I had no <laughs> idea. Um, and I actually remember when I met with them, I was like, hey, this sounds cool, but I don't know if I'd be perfect for it. Like I never went to school for product management and they're like, oh no, Mike, that's not a thing. You can't go to school for product management. So yeah. I I took that role, but I was just trying to figure out what it meant to be a product person. And um, what happened is sort of the short of it is I, as I was figuring it, I was reading blogs and books and listening to podcasts. And right at that time, I spoke at a local tech conference where the organizer I was friends with um, and had known for a few years, he was wanting to kind of do something different with this conference. And I just spoke at it and so he wanted my feedback as a as a friend and, and a speaker. And I'm like, you know, I thought it was awesome. Like the people came, people seemed to enjoy it. But there's a few, you know, tech conferences here in Cleveland and they seem to have the same attendees, a lot of the same speakers. Sure. It might be cool if you hung your hat on something specific within tech. And I go, tell you what, I'm trying to figure out what it means to be a product person. What if you made it a product conference? And it doesn't have to be about Cleveland, it just happens to be here in Cleveland. Right. And he's like, well, you seem pretty passionate about that. Like, what if we did that together? And so that that became industry. Uh, in, so now I, I, you mentioned I co-founded co Product Collective, but the big part of what we do is we organize this conference called Industry, the Product Conference. and. Mm -hmm. It's now become one of the top rated software product management conferences anywhere. And it's here in Cleveland, but last year we had attendees from 37 states and 12 countries. Um, it's, I mean, the, the people that come to speak, like this year we have Jason Fried of Basecamp. Um, I even Common, a uh, Grammy and Academy Award winning artist Common is coming. And there you go. So it, I actually know who that is. So. Yeah, I mean, it's so <laughs> that that's what I do now. So that's kind of bringing it forward to now. Um, you know, with Product Collective, aside from the conference, we like to say we operate a, a community for product people. So we have a newsletter, we have live video Q&A chats that we do a, a tw twice per month. Um, we have a Slack channel where there's around 8,000 product people from around the world that are on the Slack channel trading ideas and best practices. Um, I do co-host Rocket Ship, which that's sort of now our official podcast of Product Collective. Sure. 
Um, and then, you know, I mentor here and there. I, I, I'm an adjunct professor now at Case Western, so I actually um, introduced their first undergraduate product management class at go. Case. Which, and, which, which is not a major right now, yeah, you, anywhere, you, 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 until you change the world. Uh, well, <laughs> I, I brought the first one to Case. Some schools are starting to have more and more um, when it comes to classes that you can take. Carnegie Mellon, um, not far from here in Pittsburgh, it's the first college that they actually offer a master's degree in product management. So things are changing for sure, sure. but um, yeah, that's kind of how I keep busy. So kind of just to backtrack a little bit, how do you define what a project manager is and what does a project manager do? Yeah, so a product manager is really somebody that in a tech company, they're the ones that are working with the designers, with the developers. Um, some people do make the confusion of saying project manager as in like that's all they do. Project management is a part of product management, yeah. but I think the big difference is for a product manager, you're not just figuring out the when of how it's being built, you're actually figuring out the why and the what, right? Mm -hmm. So a great product manager is in front of customers constantly to try to just not figure out like, okay, what's the timeline of how we're building this thing? It's, should we build this thing in the first place? Mm -hmm. What should we be building, right? So um, a, oftentimes a product manager is technical. They don't have to be technical. I never was, mm -hmm. but you do have to be technical enough to speak the language of, you know, with developers, with designers. Um, so these are the people that are actually creating the product, but somebody needs to be working with them to define the requirements to figure out again what needs to be built in the first place so within a technology company that's often the role of a product manager right right so as you are kind of cultivating this product management uh community yeah. i guess what are the challenges that you're facing with that I, so one of the biggest challenges but it's also something that i think helps us and creates an opportunity for us is that Again, until very recently, but e even now, there's not a whole lot of academic like background within product management. Like most product people today, they became product people um, be because either their company figured out they needed this function and they kind of plucked them from within the company doing something else. Maybe it was being a software developer, maybe it was being a designer, whatever it might be. They just said, hey, by the way, you're a product manager now. Right, so that's one way. Another way is kind of like me, former founder, you know, where I have my hands in a bunch of different things within my company. Um, oftentimes, like that skill set is that's really good and very usable, very transferable to a product role. Um, but I, so that's a challenge though, because all of us as product managers, well, I shouldn't say all, but a lot of people that I've met internally, we have this conversation going on, like, am I doing this right? Because there's been no, again, like none of us went to school for it. There's no like playbook to say like, this is exactly how to do product management. Um, it helps us too because our community, I think it's thriving because there, like everybody feels lost or at least at one point in your career, you might feel lost as a product person. Mm -hmm. So it feels good to have people to turn to, to say, am I doing this right guys? Like right. what are you, if you had this challenge, how would you approach this? Um, so in terms of like our biggest challenges, that is one thing because there's, there's, it, it's kind of impossible to say there's an exact right way to do things. Um, I think another challenge for us is, you know, we're a bootstrapped company. Like we started this on our own. We didn't take any outside investment. It's not like, okay, we have a million dollars to play with. Right? right. Not that, you know, again, I raised money for my past company. We never looked at it as like, we have a million dollars to play with, but it does mean that you know, there's limitations to things that you can do. You have to be a lot more um, stringent, I guess, with the money that you have. You have to, like, th there's there's not a lot of wiggle room when you're bootstrapping, right? Right. So that's another challenge, too. Not not specific to product management, just for any bootstrap right. company. And, uh, and and that's kind of, I guess, what is a s separates what this project is from what the traditional, I guess, startup community views as, like, a startup where you're... you're you have something that maybe is a finished product, maybe isn't. In some cases, it could just be an idea, and then you kind of group in funding for that to help build that. You yeah. guys, essentially, I mean, it, it's it's not it's the the conference is the product, I suppose, but yeah. it's not really something that you you f get funding outside from and then try to pitch that, right? Yeah, it's I mean, different. this is a kind of business where raising outside capital isn't 
like it's not really conducive to raising outside capital. Like this is not going to be the kind of business where like this is a billion dollar, you know, opportunity, right? right? Um, definitely a great opportunity and sure. it, it's a profitable business and was from the beginning, but compared to eFuneral, mm -hmm. that was the company I had in the past. Sure much different, right? Like we were, we had a, a big vision to be this, you know, like this could be a billion dollar, you know, sure. opportunity, but it never worked out. We never found product market fit. So this has kind of been the anti e-funeral for us where we didn't need to raise money, um, but it wasn't really the type of business where you would raise money, but we found product market fit really early on. Um, so, and I do think like everything that I learned going through experience that I did with e-funeral, like it's helped me now. Like, I don't know if we'd be at the point where we are now, if I didn't have that experience before, uh, right. it's, de it's definitely helped. You know, I learned through all that. Um, but yeah, it is different. You know, a lot of people think, you know, you hear startup and you automatically think like it's venture backed and, you know, but there's a lot of other companies out there that never went that route. Like Basecamp is one that mm -hmm. comes to mind. Um, they, I mean, they're a software as a service company, very profitable, tens of millions of dollars in revenue. Um, maybe even more than that. I don't know. Like, I don't know it's exactly public and out there, but they didn't ever raise, I think they took one investment check from Jeff Bezos like oh, 10 okay. years ago <laughs> for like $50,000 or something like that. Yeah. Um, just to have Jeff Bezos, like basically Attached just to his tap name. into yeah. his mind, you sure. know, but, um, but other than that, they didn't raise money. There's a, so there's a lot of other companies out there that don't go that route, even though they are the they are the more traditional sort of venture type organization. Yeah. So it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's always it's always it, like it's just navigating those waters. The, the whole startup uh, community, I guess, is a little still new to me. Uh, in yeah. terms of like I, when I when I the first business I tried to start was actually just a computer store. Yeah. And you just you just sell computers. You don't you don't say hey yeah. I'm gonna have this computer store I have this computer store idea. It's basically like a poor man's best buy give me money so i can start a business right. right it's just you just you just start a business right, right? that's right. just how it, it kind of works and that's kind of how i'm treating the, this podcast actually yeah. you know wh whereas this isn't really a, a business that's going to fund my life the podcast does have to fund itself somehow right so but yeah i'm not shopping this around to a, a business incubator saying listen this podcast is going to be a billion dollar idea right look at what joe rogan did Right, right. This is not what this is. So yeah. I, I, it's um, and so we, we actually met through Bounce Hub, which is a, a business accelerator, and that was the first one. Where I was looking at some of the startups, and they're just like, yeah, well, we need more funding to get to this level. And then I started reading. I read your book. I read Venture Capital. Yeah. And I started talking to a lot of the guys in there. I'm like, this is bizarre. It's just, it's just really alien to <laughs> me yep. that you know you because most of the startups, at least in our incubator, really don't have their their product finished yet, and people right. are, are kind of hedging their bets on them. And I'm like, really? It's to some extent, you know, we have like half a half a software product and a, and a PowerPoint. Like, yeah. I, it's it's cool that you're helping get that to a, a finished product, but at the same time, it's scary. Um, and the weird thing is, in some cases, it's actually easier to raise money before you have your product than when your product's out and and people are using it and you have customers. Because for some investors, it's almost like the allure of the unknown. Like, sure. if they're investing in a stage where the product hasn't even been created yet, it's like, oh man. I'm gonna get in early, and if if this comes out and starts to blow up, I might not have an opportunity to, to get in at this valuation. But if you release the product, and it's, to be fair, like most products, yeah. like 99%, it's crickets at first. Yeah. And it's a hard slog in terms of trying to sell it and get people to use it. That's like normal, that's like the reality for most. But if that is the case, it's for some investors, then they shy away. It's like, well, yeah, you guys have a product, but, it it's not, yeah, yeah, it's not blowing up. So, so the weird thing is, in some cases, it's actually easier to raise money when you don't even have a product yet, which is so weird. Yeah, but it's it's it's, just, it's very alien to me, especially because yeah. I'm just like, yeah, you don't like, because you know, I'm, I'm I'm helping one of the startups in that in that incubator more than others, and and they're, they're they were the least far along by far when they started. And I'm like, people are really going to give you money for this because we're. We're not there yet. Like yeah, we're, sure. we're not there, and they're like, no, no, no. Trust me. Like this is great. Like we'll just keep we'll keep riding this wave. And and, and there's been, I mean, the software product has made leagues of, of updates, and it's it's workable now, which yeah. it wasn't in January, which is crazy for what five months like, yeah. to have to really that did accelerate the product, which is which is awesome. But it's just weird to me still, and it's always going to be a little weird to me that people are just like, yes, I want to gamble on that one. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It is a weird thing, but. It is the way that the world works and it comes to tech startups and sure. venture investing, yeah. So uh, for people that are in early stage seed funding, what is your your, your baseline advice? 
I mean, so, and I do outline yeah. some of these things in the book. I mean, I think one of the biggest things is that people, investors, they don't invest in ideas. Mm -hmm. So even though I'm saying it might be easier to raise before you actually have customers, investors generally still want to invest in something more tangible. So that might be a prototype. It might be a some sort of MVP that's like just on the cusp of being ready for customers. Mm -hmm. But it helps a lot. I mean, you know, just think about it. If somebody is sitting down with an investor and they're like, we have this idea, but we need money to even show you what it might look like. It's like, ah, I don't even know if you guys are legit, you know, right, interested yeah. about this. Like, do you have the passion to make it happen? But if you sit down with an investor and it's like, hey, look, yes, we'll, we need money to build this whole thing out full fledged, but we cobbled together this prototype by ourselves. Here's how it would look once it's working. It's at least something to get their mind uh, on the same page as yours. Like it, it allows them to see the world that you're seeing um, with the specific product. So I think the, the first thing is figure out a way to build a prototype yeah. or something tangible you could put in front of them. Um, another big thing that I love to share with people that are in that mode of raising money, um, which again, by the way, not all businesses are set up to raise money. So you don't have to think that you automatically yeah. have to raise capital. But if you do, think of, think of your world as the world, like you, you, it's oftentimes a mistake that people make is they say, okay, I'm here in Cleveland, Ohio. I'm building this company. Who are the investors in Cleveland, Ohio? That's my market. Mm -hmm. And and it is good to start with local investors because you know a lot of times, especially at the earlier stage, those investors like being able to meet you for coffee or something like that. But let's just say you have a business that is, I, I don't know, could be any vertical. Let's just say it is a data privacy you know sure. startup or something you're creating well guess what there are a lot of people out there that are super interested in that specific vertical they might not be in cleveland yeah. but they might be totally interested in investing or at least learning more and by the way those investors might be way better for your company than like some rich doctor in cleveland who knows nothing about data mm -hmm. but He's willing to cut you a check because he's, you know, he right. heard his brother-in-law told him it'd be a good thing to invest in startups, right? Sure. That person's money's green, but they're it's they're you're not going to get the insights that you would get from that other person. So really thinking about, okay, who are the specific investors that might be the perfect investors for me? And going out and finding them. You know, that just because you live in a different place doesn't mean you can't start building a relationship with them on Twitter or you know using some sort of social platform and maybe they're they're already there and so you recommend just reaching out to them and any by any means necessary yeah know, right because that was my next question is how do you how do you get these people how do you how do you attract the guy from texas that's a rich doctor that's paranoid about hipaa regulations yeah i mean i'll give you a couple examples and again these are these are just going to be specific to these people not because everybody's different but um i remember when we were raising money for e-funeral one of the people that um, I really, like he was on my target list of potential investors was David Cohen. Okay. David is the, was at the time, like I think he was one of the founders of Techstars, like managing director of Techstars. I don't know if he's in that role now, mm -hmm. but we thought he would be a, a good potential investor for us. I remember on Twitter literally saying, I, and, and this is true, like I, I was in that mode where I'm pitching so many people, right? And I had a dream that I pitched him. Yeah. And so on Twitter, I said, you know, just had a dream that I pitched David Cohen. Like, you know, yeah. I, and I tagged him in my tweet, right? And he had been somebody, though, that I was, like, sharing his articles. Like, I would reply to things that he was putting out. He was out. aware of you. He, I, You know, I, I, I think maybe if he'd see my name, it'd be like, okay, yeah, this person responds some. Like, I don't know if he knew me necessarily, sure. but, like, so he responded and said, like, hope I gave you good feedback or, you know, something like sure. that. Then that turned into me responding and said, well, I'd love to get your feedback for real. Like, would you be open to viewing our prototype? Yeah. And then that started an email conversation back and forth. We ended up going into due diligence with him. He ended up not investing. Sure. But he's been somebody that whenever I wanted feedback, I'd reach out to him and he was quick to respond. I never met him in person, right? And yeah. there's several <laughs> people like that where I built a relationship starting on Twitter. Um, maybe the creepiest thing that I've ever done to try to like get in. I remember going, uh, I needed to be in the Bay Area um, for like, and I think that we were pitching, there was some conference or something okay. we were pitching at it. And I'm like, you know what? I was gonna, you know, just stay at a hotel or Airbnb. And I'm like, I wonder if there's a way to see like, are there investors that have their places up on Airbnb? And I don't even know how I found it, but I yeah. found that there was this one 
And I'm like, well, I'll stay there. You never know what happens. And I remember when I got there, the person's like, oh, yeah, great. Your room's going to be right around the bend. Like, what are you in town for? And I'm like, well, I, I, I'm a co-founder of a tech startup, and I'm here to you know, have some meetings. He's like, oh, I actually, I do some angel investing. And I'm like, really? I know. you don't say. <laughs> and again, like that person didn't become an investor, but it's just like, the point is you can put yourself in these positions sure. to build up your network, increase the likelihood that there's even a possibility for an investment right. through things like Twitter. And, you know, again, for some verticals, maybe it's not Twitter, maybe it's LinkedIn, or maybe it's other communities that you could be but the point is just because they're not in your immediate location doesn't mean that you can't start to build relationships with Mm -hmm. them and so kind of going back to the just general startup advice aside from stalking people uh uh you you, you've you've had a a couple different uh situations that i've been a part of reference like the three h's that you need right Ah, yeah. Uh, so if you, if you, I like that a lot. So yeah. I want, want to and I didn't that make it up, and I don't even know. Who, I mean, I know Dave McClure talks about this, and there's other people, yeah. but I always think about like the, the hacker, the hipster, and the hustler. And it's it doesn't need to be three people, but it's sort of three functions mm-hmm. in a startup that I do think are really important. Sure. And, and all it really means is like the hacker is somebody that actually has the wherewithal to build the product, right? Mm-hmm. So they can, in, in a, in a technology startup it's somebody that can code you mm-hmm. know and knows ideally front end and back end but it doesn't necessarily have to be both but at least there's somebody on your team that has that hacker mm-hmm. um, hat on right mm-hmm. the hustler is somebody that can actually get out there and sell right so that's usually the person that is talking to customers usually the person that's talking to investors um, it's somebody that can take the you know what it is that you are building and paint the vision for what it can be long term and then the hipster is this is more i probably should have mentioned it before the hustler but the hipster is somebody that kind of would be like the product person right so it's not the person that's actually building but it's a person that can sort of scope out all right here's what we should be building Mm -hmm. you know here are the pain points of the customers this is how it should be designed and laid out so it's almost like the ux side of things sure um now in a team, it doesn't mean you have to have three people doing those three things. One person might be able to wear two of those hats. Sure. One person might be able to wear all three of those hats, although I, I think it's pretty rare. Mm-hmm. But that it, as long as the team has those three things covered, I think you're set up to, you're set up really well to sort of find that initial capital. If you don't, let's just say, hey, I'm a business guy, I have the ideas, I think I could go out and sell it, but I don't know exactly what should be created um, and I don't know how to build it. I'm looking for that co-founder. Well, I actually think you're probably not ready to raise money yet. I think it, you know, for an investor's point of view, in their mind, they're like, well, gosh, if if you can't really find another co-founder who can build it or you don't have the, you know, you're not able to cobble, cobble together on your own, how do I know that you're going to be able to convince another investor to invest in it? How do I know that you're going to be able to convince an employee to from some other good, you know, company at a well-paying job to join you. Like, so to them it's almost like a test. Like, can this person find the technical co-founder that they need? If they if they can, well, all right, maybe it's worth me putting some dollars in, but if they can't, in their mind it's sort of a test like you're not going to be able to do some other things down the road, too. Well, that's super interesting to me because again, going from my background of not startups I, in my head like I've always I've in business I've had mentors tell me like uh, always always be the de facto leader like partnerships don't work like yeah. don't hire friends like that, that whole like it's just it's a, it's just a different philosophy right yeah. it's like hey listen if you have a partnership make sure one person is 51 percent like like all these yeah. like all these like the like conversations and when I went to the startup world it's like hey you know we've three co-founders we're all 33 33 33 and I'm like oh Really? Like, yeah. But that's a prerequisite. Because right? I've talked to some investors and they're like, we want to see technical acumen across these things. But you're saying that it's also, uh, if there's like a, a leader per se, that he can also recruit the people that's necessary. Yeah, I mean, and, and to be fair, like, I don't think it, ha- I mean, both of the partnerships I've been involved in, it's yeah. been more of an equal split kind of a thing. Sure. I don't think it has to be that way. Mm-hmm. Like, look, if you were, let's just say you were building a company and, and you didn't have the technical chops to build it on your own, and but... But you were like, you know, it, 90% of this was you really. Mm-hmm. And you go out and find, maybe it's not a co-founder. Maybe it's you find uh, an employee, a, a guy, yeah, right? Yeah. So that person maybe has some equity, but it's not a 50-50 split. I don't think you have to have a co-founder. It doesn't have to be equal split even among co-founders. But 
it, it, it does make it really tricky if it's not like to say like, well, you're you're twenty percent and I'm eighty percent. But the reality is like I think every Everybody's individual situation is just different. Sure. So I'm not of the belief that it has to be that equal split or, or that you even have to have co-founders. I always have. I think it's there are definitely advantages to it because, mm-hmm. like, look, even the best startups in the world, they have those valleys. And when you're in the valley, like, it's pretty lonely if you have nobody down there with you, right? right. So even just for the sake of having somebody to lift you up during those times and, and you can then in turn lift that person up when maybe they're feeling it when you're in the valley and you're not, like you're in a better place. Like, I think that's a big, big benefit to having a co-founder, but, um, but I don't think you have to. I mean, there's, all, all, there's always stories of single founder companies that are amazing and do sure. really, really well too. Yeah, I don't think there's one, one way to skin the cat. I just think, I guess where I was going with that more also is like the startup culture definitely is conducive. Like they, they, they have yeah. a champion. Like, yeah, we have the we have these three studs, you know, yeah. that are that are coming out here. You, know, you definitely see this. it more yeah. often yeah, that there's multiple founders, right? Yeah. Um, and I don't know. Again, and that, that kind of brings me to the next thing I really wanted to ask you is is I don't know if that's like a Midwest thing versus a coast thing. And mm. obviously, the East Coast and West Coast are different, but they're they're closer to each other than they are to the Midwestern culture. So yeah, I guess if you can give me your thoughts on what the differences are between being a startup in the Midwest versus being a startup in, let's say, Silicon Valley or New York. Yeah, I think, first of all, like ideas, the, the best ideas ever can happen anywhere. And there's there's amazing startups that have popped up in the Midwest. There's amazing investors that have popped up in the Midwest. Um, I don't, I definitely don't believe you have to be in Silicon Valley to to be in the startup world or to have this life-changing startup. I think it's just wrong. Like there's proof out there that you don't have to be, right? right. So I do think there's differences though and, and everybody's different. So there could be somebody in the Midwest that still thinks like a Silicon Valley startup. There's somebody in the Valley that has that Midwest mentality. But oftentimes you see startup founders that are from the Midwest that are just more pragmatic, right? So sure. in their mind, when they're when they're creating the, the business model from the get-go, they're Oftentimes, they're more concerned about things like making a profit. You know, like, is this the right business model? Um, you tend to see a lot of times when the when the the business is getting started and the mentality is like, we'll figure out it. We'll figure out the business model later. Like, let's just hardcore growth. That's more of the Silicon Valley mindset, I'd say. Um, I you definitely see differences of investors in the Midwest versus in the Valley. Like great investors in the Midwest, but again, if we're going to generalize, oftentimes investors in the Midwest have a um, they have a risk tolerance. It's just much less than what you'd find in Silicon Valley, where it's it's expected that most of these startups are going to fail, and that's just like that's a given. Whereas in the Midwest, like it. It's, it's becoming better and better, but like I would say with a lot of investors, there's this like, it's it just they're harder maybe on sure. the startups. And then not everybody, but it's just, again, if we're going to put them in general buckets. So those are some things that come to mind. And you think, I guess, and I do see that a little bit where like I had a, I have a, a buddy, actually I interviewed him. He's uh, Kash Dave that started Spot Me, which is a startup that is a social media platform that uses facial recognition. Oh, cool. So it, it's, it's a little weird. I, I, and I'm, I'm basically like you're scrolling through your feed and instead of clicking like, it records your facial re- like, oh like uh, your, your face uh, response. Okay. And then it's like this many people really liked it and this many people were indifferent. And right. Like, but there's like there's some security like it's it's a very it's in early stages right yeah it, it, this is just what it is the people are very interested in, in getting in throwing money at him for this yeah but like they're just there's some security things that obviously sure. have to be you know uh, questioned I know the the funnier story that came out of it was it's in pilot you can go on there. But with any fringe social media platform, it tends to attract uh, people that were kicked off of other social media uh, platforms. Huh. So there are all sorts of uh, uh, profane and explicit uh, content that kept coming up there. And, and, and some, some things were just flat out wrong and illegal. Yeah. 
and people were having like positive facial reactions. <laughs> They're like, "Why did you like it?" I'm but like, "I didn't like but it." You can't you can't lie about it, right? It's like it's just how the thing perceives you. So like like I said, there's oh some bugs gosh. with it, but that's like an example of something that I think could only happen, I think, in Silicon Valley, and, and just because of the culture difference, and because like I look at it, and there's really not even a way to monetize it right now. Right. You know. Right. I mean, it definitely is probably one of those businesses that is more at home in Silicon Valley. Sure, right. Sure. Doesn't mean it couldn't happen here, but it. But to your point, like. Yeah. There are probably more investors there that are willing to like look at something like that and invest without even knowing what the business model is. And it might even have more people that are just like open to working with them. Um, so I could see that. So yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting, the story with like some of the things he's like, I, why do people like this? Yeah. <laughs> you know, so he just had to start cutting some of that stuff out. But um, as far as like, if you're, so if I'm a Midwestern startup, and I have some funding and I'm looking to grow. Uh, do you recommend that they continue? They, obviously, they can get funding from wherever. They don't yeah. have to get funding from where they're at. But there's a lot of startups that I have reached out to. They're like, yeah, you know, we're moving to Colorado. Yeah, you know, we're right. thinking, about, thinking about moving to a different, you know, accelerator incubator far away because there's more resources there. Yeah. What, like, do you agree with that? Or, or I guess where do you stand on I that? I mean, there definitely might be more resources in some places, but that comes at a cost, right? Sure. So if you're going to try to find a software engineer in Palo Alto or probably even Boulder, Colorado, that is going to come at a much different cost than trying to find it in Cleveland, Ohio. And by the way, there's talent in Cleveland, Ohio. Like, yeah. I know this because I, I see these people all the time, like in the startup community here um, at Case. Like again, yeah. I, I'm an adjunct professor at Case. I'm seeing these students come out of Case and oftentimes they're moving to those places because in their mind, they don't even know what exists around here, right? Right. Um, and not just Case, like there's talented software developers and designers at all sorts of other universities oh, here in sure. yeah. So like there's talent here for sure. Um, is there more talent in other places? Yes. But again, in those other places, in the cost of a one bedroom apartment versus the cost of one bedroom apartment here might be five times, four to five times. Like that's not, in San Francisco, it's not even an exaggeration, you know? Sure. So you have to pay those people a lot more. Um, so again, there's just sort of, there's a balance there. I know startups that have moved and they felt like moving was the best thing to do for their company and you can't fault them for that because mm -hmm. if you feel like that's the best thing for your company you got to do what's right for you right but i also don't believe that you have to move and i don't believe that you have to i don't believe that there isn't talent here and that you couldn't start a good company and have it exist here i mean like some of the people told me in the very beginning we couldn't start a tech conference in Cleveland. Or, you know, if we did, you can't make money from it. And, um, or if you want to do it in the Midwest, you have to then go to Chicago. Yeah. But like, we're doing it, you know? Like, and I, I know people that have done it too. Like, we're not the first one. So, well, there's, there's, there's Blockland and, and MAICon that are both in Cleveland now too. Yeah. And even like Content Marketing World, like that, the founder of Content Marketing World, Joe Polizzi, his, he's definitely become a mentor to us. Mm -hmm. And Content Marketing, it's like, it, it is, I would, I would consider it a technology conference. I mean, obviously it's a marketing conference, but like they get 3,000 plus people here, you know, and, and it, from all over the world and they did it here in Cleveland year after year after year. So like I'm seeing these other conferences happen. I know for, well, now I know because of ours too, but like right. I know that you can be profitable and you could have a conference that's thriving here. I, I bring that up because it's no different than saying like, well, you can't start a, company because of talent. Well, I know there are extremely talented yeah. companies here that have found talent here and have made it work. But, um, but again, it goes both ways. Like I don't, I don't, it, I have friends that have moved out West and they're doing really well. Like, so you can't fault them for that either. Yeah. And I think that's, that's a challenge that a lot of, a lot of the startups that are at, at Bounce Hub even are really like, yeah. they're struggling with. And, and my, my viewpoint is like, Hey, if you have like a family here and it, you just stay here and just, you know, figure things out, you know. Yeah. But, and, and there's a resource thing from, like, an employee standpoint, but there's also, like, a general, like, what is the city doing to reinvest in some of those startups? Yeah. And, and I guess I'm a little ignorant to what Colorado is doing that Cleveland isn't, but I definitely think that Cleveland is, is trying, right? Well, and I think a place like Boulder, Colorado, or certainly, like, the Bay Area, they don't really have to do things you know, they don't have to make efforts as a startup community like Cleveland does. Like Cleveland has to make a lot more efforts mm -hmm. if they want to attract startups and keep founders here. Um, 
or, or startup employees here because it's not a level playing field. Like Boulder doesn't have to do anything because they already have this amazing thriving community. They have companies that have exited and like it's already this awesome place if you're a startup. Mm -hmm. Cleveland is aspiring to be that. So in order to get to that point, you have to make a lot more effort to, to get there. It's sort of like saying like, here's a bodybuilder and then here's some fat guy, yeah. you know, that it's like, well, right here. yeah, <laughs> uh, here's the, <laughs> no, but like if I, if I wanted to be, you know, if I wanted to be a bodybuilder, like that bodybuilder, certainly that person has to do things to maintain, right. but they don't have to do what I have to do to get to that level. Like sure. I have to do so many different things to get to that level. So it's sort of, like, I don't know why I came up with that analogy, no, but like, fine. it's sort of like that. It's applicable. Yeah. Um, I guess, so what, if you are, I guess, if you were looking at like the tech scene in terms of like Cleveland, what kind of technology do you see Cleveland adopting faster as a result of Cleveland trying to make itself more attractive? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I actually, I know you mentioned like, you know, there's this effort around block land yeah. and block. I actually don't know that there's one technology that is like Cleveland's thing right now. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that that's a problem. Like, honestly, like there's companies I know that are in the SaaS world. Um, there are some blockchain startups that are going and, you know, partly because of those efforts. I don't know that that's our thing quite yet, right? Well, I don't know if blockchain is going to be a thing quite yet. I, I don't know. Yeah, I have no idea yeah. is the reality, right? Yeah, like yeah. I'm, I'd be lying if I said like sure. I knew. But I don't know that any... Like for me, as a person that's again started up a couple companies here, it wasn't important to me that like I'm like, wow, man, Cleveland hasn't had any death care startups in the past. Like I don't know if e funeral can thrive here. Sure. Whereas Chicago's had a couple. Like I need to go to Chicago. I don't know that, that. Like to me, that didn't make much of a difference. What made a difference to me as a startup founder is I'm I, there was this pain point I was trying to solve for. I was dead set on trying to solve that problem. And I'm like, you know what? As long as I can find talent here and, you know, we can, you know, as long as there's smart people alongside me to try to attack this problem, we can find investment, which both of those things were checkboxes. Like, we were in a position to do it. So I don't know that a city has to have a thing that they're hanging their hat on, like one specific technology. If it does, I don't know what Cleveland's is yet, you know, and I don't yeah. know. It could be anything. I though really like yeah. could it be product management technology <laughs> platforms could it be software as a service sure but i don't know that it really matters honestly i can definitely see that i, th I just think that as as we position ourselves more and more i've seen a lot of efforts i guess the reason why i asked that question was i've seen obviously block land's a pretty big initiative here sure but there's also uh you know what, what's going on in the health tech corridor with vr and yeah. augmented reality like they're doing augmented or virtual reality surgeries you know we have Lincoln Electric doing augmented reality welding. I would like to see some of those efforts kind of, com or uh, not combined, but brought together. Right? And you know, there I mean, there are benefits for, yeah. for sure. Like when you're mentioning that, there's definitely benefits when you have multiple companies around something because then there's just like more collaboration opportunities. Sure. Maybe there's, there's talent where it's like, okay, if it didn't work out for one company, another company is going to keep them. So you're right about that yeah. for sure. For as far as what could Cleveland's be, I mean, again, we do have a big health, you know, yeah. you have the Cleveland Clinic here, you have university hospitals. Um, so there's always, there's there's definitely startups in like the med tech type space. Mm -hmm. um, beyond that, I mean, yeah, I mean, you probably know more than I do about the, like what's going on with Air VR. I do know Case does a lot with yeah, they, they um, do quite VR. A bit, yeah. they have, so maybe that can be one of these things. I imagine there's other cities where they have those things too. So it's tough. I don't really know the answer is the sure. reality of it. Well, that's why you were here to give us the answers. <laughs> <laughs> Darn it. Cancel it. Shut it off now. <laughs> Well, uh, as we are, as we're kind of wrapping up, I do want to ask you, like, what what do you want to plug? Is there any is there anywhere you want people to go on the internet, or do you want people to find you somewhere else in the real world? Like, <laughs> what, what can the internet do for you? <laughs> I mean, if you're going to Rising Star, often you probably find me in the real world. Okay. Um, but like, no, really, yes. If you're a software product person, or really any kind of technology product person. I would say go to productcollective.com, mm -hmm. you know, join, join our community. It's free. Like to get involved in some of the stuff we do, joining our Slack group, um, meeting other people, like all that's free. The conferences we, you know, yes, that yes. Co it costs money to come to the conferences. But does that mean, does that mean it costs you money to set a conference? Believe it or not. Right. Wow. Yeah. How about free? that? Yeah. How about that? 
A lot more, <laughs> yeah, a lot more than one might imagine. A lot more than I imagined in the very beginning. But, um, yeah, I mean, I will say my opinion, and I wouldn't say it if it wasn't true. Like, I believe we put on the best technology product management conference in the world, right? And we've, like, we do use NPS to sort of um, gauge, like, NPS isn't the end-all be-all, but N NPS as a score, it does help us gauge, like, okay, compared to last year, how, how, are we going up? Are we going down? And then we love interviewing customers afterwards, too. But our, you know, keeps going up. Like, now we're in that world-class range. Um, cause there's, like, a certain level where it's considered world-class. So, I believe we have a world-class product conference here in Cleveland. So if it is something you're interested in learning more from, you know, people in person, meeting other people, um, come to Industry too. You know, you could go to industryconference.com. That's the yeah. website. When learn is that? More. We have September is mm -hmm. our global edition, and then we do a European edition every spring. Okay. So I just came back from Dublin, Ireland a couple weeks ago for that. Welcome back. Thank you very we much. We missed you. Um, and then I'm on Twitter. It's just at Belsito, just B-E-L-S-I-T-O. So um, you might find me getting into Twitter wars with certain people <laughs> in tech and startup world. Yeah. You might find me talking about fantasy football. You might yeah, find me, you know, posting dad jokes. You know, it's just sure. you never know what to expect. Yeah, most recently made a dad joke about a uh, six-year-old that's going on 16. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> so my son is six, and we, he has an Amazon Echo in his room. Okay. So I was, like, out running around doing errands yesterday, and all of a sudden, I look, and there's these messages from him that he's leaving his voice messages, but Alexa, the app, transcribes it. So to me, it's just like text. <laughs> and the way he's, you know, he's, yeah. I'm looking at the text, and he's like, you're a noob, and I'm a pro at Fortnite, and you suck. How come you're not reading my messages? And I'm like, is my son six, or is he a teenager at this point, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's kind of hard to tell. Well, that's that's... <laughs> I can't relate because I don't have a six-year-old, but I get it. Wow. It was entertaining. You wait. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah so I, I really appreciate you coming on yeah. sharing, sharing some of your knowledge. I'll have a link to all of your uh, you know, Slack channel, the Product Collective, your book, your Twitter. Awesome. Um, any Airbnbs you might host, <laughs> right? All that will be available on the audio and the video RSS feeds. So. Oh, I appreciate that. No, and in all seriousness, like I, I love meeting up with people, and I do it often, like just for coffee. If the, you know, so if there's every ever people out there that want feedback or whatever, like it might sometimes finding the right time might be difficult, but particularly if you're willing to come to near where I am, which is usually like Lakewood or Ohio City, mm -hmm. meet up at Rising Star or Fresh Brewed Coffee or something like sure. that. I'm I'm usually up for that. So. Perfect. You know where to find them. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah.